Jimmy for this music ministry this morning certainly we are blessed and we're grateful that God is speaking through song I want to call your attention to the book of Habakkuk chapter 3 let's look at the last three verses of that chapter. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall the fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stall. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God 
of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength and he will make my feet like hinds feet and he will make me to walk upon mine high places. To the chief singer on my string instruments. I want to talk about how to deal with life's questions how to deal with life's questions. Say that with me wherever you are. How to deal with life's questions. We're living in a dangerous world. It was unlike the world that Rebecca lived in. Habakkuk also lived in a dangerous world. Habakkuk was a man who had some questions and he's referred to by some as the doubting Thomas of the Old Testament. It has been said that he had a question mark for a brain. He had some questions and he seemed to be unable to get some answers to those questions and so he's disturbed about them. The name Habakkuk means to wrestle. It means to wrestle or embrace. As you read the substance of his book you will discover that he does wrestle with some questions and he does embrace the promises of God to those questions. One of the myths going around today is that once you become a Christian, all of your questions will be answered. The truth of the matter is that some of the main questions will be answered like the question of the forgiveness of sin, the question about your eternal destiny. Those questions will be answered but there are other questions that will remain. Questions like why is there evil in the world. Why does God permit evil to continue in the world? So becoming a Christian does not eliminate questions. Sometimes it adds more questions. The question of unanswered prayer. And so we can learn from this man Habakkuk. That's why I'm preaching today about Habakkuk. Yeah. And so what he did was he raised some questions before the Lord. He waited on the Lord to answer those questions. And he's singing some wonderful songs yeah. at the end of his book. I wonder if you had an audience with the President of the United States, would there be some questions that you would like to ask him? If you went before the Lord, would there be some questions that you would like to ask the Lord? Well, we read about questions that Habakkuk had. And when we read about these questions, when we look at his book, we see that there is a burden, there is a vision, and there is a song. We learn from this man, Habakkuk, how to come to grips with the great questions of life that he's dealing with. Habakkuk faces these questions in a very unusual way. We learn 
the answers to these questions in these three chapters. First of all, I want us to look at Habakkuk's turmoil, what he says. Habakkuk's turmoil, what he says. Look at verse 1. Chapter 1, verse 2. O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear me, even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save? What you have here is a dialogue between the prophet and God, and he's crying out to the Lord. Look what he says. He says, how long, O Lord, shall I cry, even cry out? The first word means to call. The second word means to scream. And so he's screaming out to God, Lord, you're not listening to me. You're not hearing what I have to say. He's wrestling with the double enigma of the providence of God. Hold me up, Holy Ghost. He has some questions, and the first question he raises is that the Lord seems to be inactive. He's dealing with the inactivity of God. <laughs> Lord, uh, why aren't you doing something about this situation? Yeah. I don't know about you, but I've been there. <laughs> I've been there where I have questioned and called and screamed yeah. to the Father. Yes, why are you inactive? The inactivity of God. <laughs> He looks around and sees all the sin and all the evil of his own people, the people of Judah. And God seems to be inactive. God doesn't seem to be doing anything about the situation. And he's crying out and screaming, saying, Help, Lord. I'm crying bloody murder. Aren't you listening? Why don't you listen? to me. Look at verse 3 and follow him. And he begins to go over the crimes of Judah. Look what he says. He says, Why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance for spoiling and violence are before me? And there are that raise up strife and contention. He, 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 he's concerned about the crimes of Judah, his own people. Many of the same things are characteristic of our day. He talks about how wicked people seem to prevail. He talks about the fact that justice doesn't seem to be done. That's what he's talking about. It's a replica of our day. In fact, he says in verse 4, he says the law is slack. That means the law is falling to pieces. He says judgment does not go forth. He says justice is a joke. It seems that the whole justice system is evil. That's what he's saying. It's right here. Look at it. And the criminals are going free. The folk who ought to be locked up are going free. And the innocent ones are suffering. That's what he's saying. And so he's perplexed because of the inactivity of God. Why is God allowing this to go on? Um, I thought the same thing sometimes. Why, why is God inactive? Why isn't God moving? Why are the evil folk and the low down and dirty folk seem to be getting ahead? He has some questions yes, about the inactivity of
of God. Look what he says in verse, in verse 5. You hang in here. I'm on my way somewhere. <laughs> Look at what he says in verse 5. He says, Behold ye among the heathen, and regard, and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your day, which you will not believe, <laughs> though it be told you. Look what he says in verse 6. He says, he says, Lo, I will raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march to the breath of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. He says, he says, Rebecca, he says, I'm getting ready to do a work. I'm getting ready to do something so stunning that no one is going to believe it. <laughs> he, said, he said, I'm going to raise up the Babylonians to chastise my own people, and they are worse than my people. That's what he says right here. I'm going to punish my people by using the Babylonians to chastise my own people. Yeah. Look at verse 7. Look at verse 7. And right on down. He gives a description of the brutality and the cruelty of the Babylonians. He says, I want you to see that they are unbelievable, cruel, and brutal, vicious, and violent. He says in verse 7, they are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed themselves. And he uses the world of nature to describe what he's talking about. He says, their horses are swifter than the leopard and are more fierce than the evening wolves. The last part of the verse says, they shall fly as the eagle that hasteth to eat. He says, he says to Becca, don't you worry about my inactivity. He says, because I'm getting ready to do something. I'm getting ready to push, punish my people. And I'm going to use the Babylonians to do it. And so he not only answers his question, but he answers it in an unusual way, and it raises a bigger question. Look at verse 12. This is Rebecca talking back to God. God has talked to him, now he's talking back to God. He says, Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, mine holy one? We shall not die, O Lord. Thou hast ordained them for judgment. And, O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. He, he says, he says, Are you the eternal one, O Lord, the almighty one? He says, Thou art pure, pure eyes, than to behold evil. He said, Lord, I, I, I don't understand this either. <laughs> he says, not only do I have a problem with your inactivity, right. but I have a problem with your inconsistency. Look at it. <laughs> he, he says, what's going on here, Lord? <laughs> Uh, many times we have uh, questions that we want the Lord to answer, and sometimes it's not only about his inactivity, yeah. it's about his inconsistency. Yeah. So these verses talk about the fact that God is using these wicked people to punish his people. Yeah. And so that raises questions in my mind. And so right on down from verse 14, right on down, he, uh, he, he, he just talks about um, the Babylonians likening them to fish in the water that's taken out of the water and put up on the banks. That's what he describes. And he's talking about the inconsistency 
of God. And so he seems to say to us that the first thing you need to do when you feel that God is being inconsistent, he says, take your honest questions to the Lord. He says, it's all right to ask your questions. You remember when Jesus was going through his Calvary experience, he asked the Lord, why? Why, Lord, why hast thou forsaken me? And so we see his turmoil, what he says. But I want you to notice quickly, not only his turmoil, what he says, but notice his tower, what he sees. Notice his tower in chapter 2. Now he does a wise thing. If you have some questions that you don't understand, don't let those questions cause you to be an agnostic. When you have questions that you don't understand and don't know how to deal with them, don't drop out of the church. Don't become a pessimist. Do like Habakkuk did. Look what he says in verse 1. Stay with me now. He says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and I will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I'm reproved. Habakkuk says, I, I tell you what I'm going to do. I, I'm going to build me a watchtower. Yeah. Now that was coming back there because first of all they needed a watchtower in the fields because people would steal the produce. And then sometimes animals would steal the produce. And so they had watchtowers back there uh, so that they could watch the produce and watch the field. Right, right. It was kind of a secluded thing. Yes, sir. They were kind of out there where there was no activity of life. And so Habakkuk is saying, I'm going to get up to a little higher perspective. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> he says, he's, <clears throat> oh, I wish you were here so I could see. Uh, this walking down the aisle shaking hands with you. <laughs> he says, he says, he says, what I'm going to do, I'm going to get in my tower yeah, yeah. and I'm going to get a little higher perspective on my situation. Yeah. When there are problems that you don't understand, you need a higher perspective. Oh, yes, sir. Jesus called it a closet. He says in Matthew 6, 6, when you pray, enter into your closet and shut the door. And the Father who sees in secret will reward thee openly. Yes. He's talking about some place that you need to get along with the Lord when you have these questions and when problems don't seem to get resolved. He said you need to get in your tower. You need to get in your prayer closet so that God can give you a higher perspective on your situation. You need a tower. Yes, sir. Prayer is your watch tower. I love that hymn that says, Lord, lift me up and let me stand. By faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. <laughs> That's what Rebecca is talking about. <laughs> you need to get a little higher perspective <laughs> uh, when the situation seems drab and drear. Dark situations. Yeah. 
You need a tower. You need higher ground. That's why I keep telling you that prayer goes up to God as worship. Out to man as work, down to hell as warfare. We worship and work and war at the same time. When you pray. When you pray. And so we need to learn to look at things from the perspective of God. <laughs> look what he says. <laughs> he says, I'm going to wait and see what God will say. <laughs> That's what you need to do. <laughs> you need to wait <laughs> and see <laughs> what God will say. He's going to speak. <laughs> you just got to wait on him. <laughs> Thank you, Habakkuk. Yeah. Look at verse 2. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon the tablets that he may run that readeth it. Uh, back there they made public announcements and they wrote them on tablets and he says I want you to put it big enough. I want you to make the announcement big enough so that if someone is running by they can still read it. <laughs> That's what he said. That's really what he's saying right here. So the Lord says I'm fixing to give you an answer here. I'm fixing to help you deal with these perplexing questions that you have, Habakkuk. Yeah. Habakkuk, it's big. I want you to write it so that people can read because I'm about to speak. Yes. Mm. And so what Habakkuk is going to learn from the Lord here in his tower is how to, how to view the perplexing problems of his time. Right. He gives the first answer in verse 3. Look what he said. Look what he said. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. He says, Rebecca, listen. He says, first of all, it's a matter of timing. Yes. That's what he said. Look what he said. It's right here. He says, he says, for the vision is yet for a appointed time. Yeah. Uh, and so the Lord is saying to Rebecca, and I'm saying to everyone listening to me today who's got a problem and some questions, yeah. it's a matter of timing. That's really what he's saying right here. He says, there is an appointed time and you wait for it. He says, if it tarries, if it seems long, if it seems slow, if it seems like I'm not moving, yeah. he says, I've timed it perfectly. Yeah. It's a matter of timing. Yes, <laughs> Even though it may be slow in coming. But I want you to know that I'm always on time. <laughs> oh, bless his name. I hope you can hear me. I'm stomping. Bless his name. I'm having me a good time today. Because I got some questions that I need answers to. And the Lord is saying, you got to wait on me. Because it's a matter of timing. Yes. You see, uh, there are two great mountains in life. Right. There's the mountain of birth and the mountain of death. Yeah. And in between those two mountains, you got the valley of time. Oh. Time is the stream that connects the first eternity to the last eternity. It's a matter of time. I've got a witness up in here. I wish I had time to talk about time because sometimes time seems to be the agent of destruction <laughs> because what it does to man, <laughs> it'll bend you over in your back. It'll make your footsteps short. It'll change the locks of your hair gray. Pull all your teeth. Time. Yes, sir. 
seems to be the agent of destruction. 20 years ago, I had a head full of hair, but time's been working on me. <laughs> you see me. You looking at me today. You can tell time has been working on me. <laughs> Bless his day. But I got some news for you. Time's working on you too. It's a matter of time. <laughs> Just a matter of time. Yes, yes. Hold me up, Holy Ghost. Yes, yes, yes. Not only does time seem to be the agent of destruction, but it's the mother of progress. <laughs> Before a girl can become a woman, it takes time. Before a boy can become a man, it takes time. Before an acorn can become an oak, it takes time. I tell you what you do. Take your dreams and rock them in the cradle of time, and they'll come out all right. It's a matter of time. Yes. Bless his name. Yes, sir. But it's not the measure of time, it's the management of time. Not how long you have, but what you do with the time that you have. God says, it's a matter of time. God is saying, I have a plan for your life. I have a schedule for your life. You just wait on me. And I'm going to deal with it. But listen, listen, I got some good news for you. If, yes, if you just wait on me, let me get to it. I got, listen, it's some stuff in this text <laughs> that's going to make a Baptist shout and holler. Yes. There are five woes here. I, I want to run down these real quickly. I, I don't want to hold you too long. Look, look, look at this. Five woes. Uh, Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 6. He says, woe to him that increases that which is not his. He, he, says, he says there's a problem of greed. You know? People wanting that which is not theirs. Greed. Verse 9, woe to him that coveteth an evil covetousness to his house. That's the problem of covetousness. Verse 12, woe to him that buildeth a town with blood and establish a city by iniquity. That's the problem of violence. We're living in a time of violence, a time of covetedness, a time of greed. Yes, sir. These are sins of America. The rich getting richer of the labor of the poor. Today, in America, the fat cats looking out for themselves and their portfolio. Today, in America, who got the tax break? The rich. The middle class didn't get anything. You put the rest to it. You know what I else I want to say. I don't have time. Look, watch it. Look, look at verse 15. Woe to him that giveth his neighbor drink, <laughs> that putteth the bottle to him. <laughs> yeah. That's the sin of seduction. Okay. Verse 19, warn to him that saith to the wood, awake to the dumb stone, arise, it shall teach. Behold, it is laid over with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in the midst of it. That's the sin of idolatry. Well, why, why did he bring all this up? Habakkuk, you, you, you just wait and see what I'm going to do. In time, I'm going to deal with these problems. Look at verse 14. For the earth shall be filled with knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. 
That's a prediction of the coming again of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> the Lord says that I'm coming and I'm going to dwell and deal with all of these problems. It's a matter of timing. Well, what do you do with life's problems? What do you do with life's questions? First of all, you learn to wait on the Lord. Have you learned to wait on the Lord? Have you learned to wait and let God work? One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. It says, it says, they that wait upon the Lord, they shall mount up. Look what he said. With wings as eagles, they shall mount up. That's talking about youth. You mount up when you're young. They shall run and not be weary. That's middle-aged folk. You're running. They shall walk and not faint. That's old folk. <laughs> he deals with three classes of folk. Young folk who mount up. Huh? Middle-aged folk who run and are not weary. And then old folk who walk and not faint. Look what he says. It's a wonderful lesson in life to be able to deal with the unanswered questions of life. And when you and I learn to wait on the Lord, he says, number one, it's all a matter of timing. And then he says, heard it, look at verse 4. He says, behold, his soul shall be lifted up, not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. <laughs> there are two kinds of people in the world. He says there are those who uh, believe they can handle it, handle it themselves. That's what he's saying. He's talking about people who are bloated and puffed up in their own opinion, but their soul is empty. They're trusting in themselves. They're depending upon themselves. Then he says there are the other folk who live by faith. Huh? He says, the just shall live by faith. I shared that with you last week and told you that in the New Testament there are three references to this verse. One is Romans 1.17. It's quoted there. And the emphasis there is on the just. And then the second time is in Galatians 3.11. And the emphasis there is upon live. And the third time is in Hebrew 10.38. And the emphasis there is upon faith. Learning to trust in God. That's why the Lord allows us to have these questions and allows us to have these problems so that we can learn how to trust in him. It's a matter of time, but it's also a matter of trust. And so what do you do when you have questions, unanswered questions? What do you do when you have unresolved problems? He says, first of all, keep on trusting in the Lord. Take your honest questions to the Lord. So first of all, his turmoil, what he says. Secondly, his tower, what he sees. But notice his triumph, what he sings. Notice his triumph. It's right here. He talks about his triumph in the third chapter. Habakkuk is a changed man. He starts off with a sob and ends in a song. He starts off in gloom and ends in glory. He starts off with a question mark and ends with an exclamation mark. He starts out in the valley, ends on the mountain top. What makes for this, preacher? Has God changed? No, God does not change. Have the circumstances changed? No, Habakkuk has changed. Now he's getting ready to sing a song for the Lord. Look at this chapter. It's a prayer of, look what he says, a prayer of Rebecca. Yes. The prophet upon Shigaonath. Look 
what he says. Uh, in, in, verse, in verse 19, he says, The Lord is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds feet. That's what he says. And he will make me to walk upon mine high places to the chief singer on the string instruments. To the chief singer on the string instrument. Notice that. So here's a song and it is dispersed three times and ends with Selah. Look at verse 3. God came from Teman and the Holy One from Paran, Selah. Verse 9. Thy bow was made quite naked according to the oaths of the tribes, even thy word Selah. And then in verse 13, he uses again Selah. Selah was a musical notation that gave you a pause in the music so you could say now, what do you think of that? That's, what, that, that, that's how you read that. Habakkuk is talking to the Lord. He's been talking to the Lord. Now he's singing to the Lord. It's a prayer revival. Look at verse 1. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, upon Shigaonath. First of all, notice it's a prayer, a prayer song. That's really what it is. Look at verse 2. O Lord, I've heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, receive my work in the midst of the years, in the midst of the years made known in wrath. Remember mercy. Listen, God is the one who solves the problems of life. That's what Habakkuk is saying to us today. That's what the Lord is saying to us today. God solves the problems of life. God solves the problems of society. Don't look to the government to solve the problems of society. It'll never happen. God is the one who solves the problems and normally he does it by sending a revival. I remember in the land of England, deism was quite prevalent and God sent a man by the name of John Wesley and he sent revival. In America, during the days of the colonies, God sent Jonathan Edwards, and he also sent George Whitfield, and it was those persons who brought revival. We will know when revival comes, when social cultures change. And people will get saved. So we need to pray for Revival. Why do we need to pray for revival? Because the church is weak today. I've never seen the church so weak in my lifetime as it is today. And when the church is weak, the people become wicked. And so God is chastising his people. Because the church is weak. Watch it, watch it, watch it. And so in verse 3, it's a description of God coming down. Listen, God has not lost his power. I want you to remember that today. God has not lost his power. But then we come to verse 17. It's not only a prayer song, it's a praise song. Get this. This is what I've been trying to get to. Look what he says. <laughs> he says, although the fig trees shall not blossom. In other words, the fig trees won't bear any fruit. Neither shall fruit be in the vine. Even the grape vines 
won't bear any grapes. He says, although the labor of the olive shall fail, there'll be no olives on the trees, and the field shall yield no meat, no crops. And the flock shall be cut off from the fold, no animals. And there shall be no herd in the stall, no little animals coming along. <laughs> That's what he's saying. He's saying everything has collapsed. He's saying with everything collapsed. He says in verse 18, yet will I trust in the Lord. Here's what you got to do. <laughs> the Holy Spirit gave it to me. You got to collect, you got to connect verse 17 with verse 18. Although, yet, they go together. <laughs> Although, yet, yes. if the stock market collapse, yes. yet, yes. if you lose your job, yet, yes. if you got an incurable disease, yet, Yes. Whatever happens to you, there's a yet. Aye, aye, yes. Don't just focus on the although. Although there be no herd in the stall. Yes. Although there be no grapes on the vine. Yes. Yet will I trust in the Lord. That's what he say. <laughs> yet yes. will I trust in the Lord. Although I can't see my way. Yes. Although I don't have any money. Yes, sir. Although I'm perplexed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although I feel alone. Yet. Right, right. Will I trust in the Lord? Yes, sir. Although yet. You remember that although yet. Don't just bring your all those to the Lord. Remember there's a yet. Yet will I trust in the Lord. Bless his name. Bless his name. Suppose my help, suppose my help fails, preacher. Yet. Suppose I lose my job, preacher. Yet. Suppose the economy fails. Yet. Because he says, look what he says. If I had time, I, I wish I had time to exegete that 19th verse. He says, the Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds feet. Yes, sir. He says, he says what, what the Lord is going to do. I'm going to be like a deer on top of the mountain. That's what he says. Oh. With perfect coordination. <laughs> That's really what he said. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> he says, he says, you're gonna be like a deer. <laughs> if you got all these problems today, you're gonna be like a deer on top of the mountain with perfect coordination, walking on the high places. <laughs> God is gonna lift you up on the mountain top. Yes, 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 yes. And when you get up there, yeah. I'm reminded of the old fellow who's a mountain climber, and he oh. uh, had a young protege, and he took him up for the first time. And finally, when the young man reached the summit, <laughs> reached the mountain, he's up there jumping around and, you know, just excited. And yeah. the old man said to him, said, son, he said, listen, he says, I know you've never been up here. <laughs> he says, but I've been up here many times. And there are cross winds up here. <laughs> he says, in order to stay up on this mountain, you need to get on bending knees. <laughs> because there are cross winds up here. <laughs> Bless his name. <laughs> you handle the successes of life by staying on your knees. Glory to God. I want to shout. Ah, 
bless his name. Bless his holy name. As the song we used to sing, I'm climbing high mountains, trying to get home. I ought to sing that for you. I want to remind you what I'm doing. I'm climbing, oh God, high mountains, and I'm trying to get home. <laughs> I don't know about you, but uh, if you're climbing, high mountains and you trying to, to get home. I want to tell you that you just got to be persistent. You got to keep on climbing. Don't give up. Don't give up. You just keep on climbing. I remember at my graduation, I remember Dr. Ellsworth gave an illustration. He said there were two mountain climbers climbing this high mountain and they got halfway up the mountain and one of the climbers stopped there and stayed there and he said to us when you're climbing don't stop at halfway house you need to keep on climbing and I've never forgotten that that I've been climbing the high mountains trying to get home. <laughs> Listen, I feel better now. <laughs> I feel like I'm going to shout. <laughs> Good God Almighty, wherever you are, shout with me. <laughs> wherever you are. Mm. Bless his name. Heads about eyes are closed. I want to pray for you right now that God would be allowed to come into your heart if you're not saved. Yeah. That you let him in and you pray this prayer with me, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, save me. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner by birth. I receive your finished work on Calvary's cross. Please forgive me my sins. I repent. Save me. I want to go to heaven when I die. That prayer will get you saved. Oh, bless your name. Remember, when you have questions, unanswered questions. Wait on the Lord. Wait on his timing. And you got to trust him for he will show up. Bless his name. See you next week. I think we need to be reminded that everything that happens to us is either God allowed a God arranged. So we learn to trust God's power and we learn to trust God's promises. You see, whenever the Lord allows us to go through the furnace, he keeps his hand on the thermostat and his eye on the thermometer, which means that he regulates the heat. <laughs> and that's what I like about the Lord. Grandmama would put it this way. He won't put any more on you than you can bear. There is a law of thermodynamics that says the greater the heat, the greater the expansion. And that's what God is trying to get us to do. He's trying to get us to expand our maturity. I remember years ago, I was on my way to Chicago. I got out on I-57. I saw a little truck that said, we do light hauling. I drove 70 miles and saw a big 18-wheeler that said, we hauled everything. 
And some of us are doing light hauling. And God wants us to haul some of that heavy stuff. And that's why he's allowing us to go through the furnace. But he's going to bring us through. He's going to bring us through these pandemic times. As I said in the message, we learn to wait on him. And we learn to trust him. Listen, thank you for standing with us uh, during this time of challenge. We are challenged just like you. Our church is challenged. We thank those who are supportive and uh, those who are uh, bringing their tithes to the office and those who are uh, giving by Givelify and PayPal and credit cards and all of those things. I want to make a special appeal to you that if you just kind of up the amount that you're giving, that would certainly be appreciative and we certainly need it. And thank you for standing with us. And I want to stand with you. I'm praying for you. I hope you will reheat the message today because I think that message will help get us through these peerless times, troublesome times, challenging times. God bless you. Be safe. And I'll see you next week.